Welcome to Virtual Thoughts, episode number four, where I am with Lynn LeBlanc, the CEO of Hotlink. Tell us a little bit about what Hotlink does. Well, hi, Edward, and thanks for, for having me on, on this episode. So Hotlink specializes, and always has, in, in hybrid IT. And, you know, even back before hybrid IT was, was, a, was a mainstream um, use case that, that customers were, were going after, um, Hotlink has, has focused on make it, making it easy for customers to adapt all of their existing management infrastructure to embody the hybrid resources they need, whether they're hybrid pub in the public cloud and disparate public clouds, I mean, um, hybrid in the sense of other hypervisors on premise. And we make it possible, and we're the only ones that make it possible for all of customers existing on-premise virtualization infrastructure, the management of it, and generally that is predominantly VMware, all of the existing infrastructure now is seamlessly extended to on-premise or cross-platform resources. So for, for those of the watchers who are VMware administrators, as you know, in vCenter, there's a unified inventory tree. Typically, you see all vSphere hosts and virtual machines, and now in a native way, you would see other hypervisors and their virtual machines, public cloud accounts, and uh, their instances. And it's very natural management because all of the functions that people are used to doing using vCenter are now extended to these other platforms. And importantly, vCenter then serves as an integration hub for all of the surrounding tools and processes that have been built into you know, a mature um, on-premise data center. And so when customers are wanting to consider um, other resource types, including public cloud resources, the, the idea is, you know, changing methodologies, changing tool sets, changing management is really the most expensive part of incorporating a new platform. And so Hotlink is all about making that a simple, easy, low cost proposition. We have also... Well, before, we, before we go on to the, your ne next thing, this is actually one of the reasons why I actually wanted to have Lynn on Virtual Thoughts is that when you start thinking about hybrid IT or hybrid software-defined data centers or even hybrid cloud, we all have cell phones. We all access anything from that, and that's part of our cloud. But the real gutcha I find is just how do you manage it? I mean, what is it that you require to manage three or four different cloud services. And we did a poll at the virtualization practice. It was um, a small poll, but we just did a one single question. It was, how many clouds do you use? And we were surprised by the answer that most people use three to four different clouds, very point solutions on what they're doing. That meant they had three to four different management infrastructures for these three to four different clouds. And they had admins that were specialized in one thing and then another set of admins specialized in the other. Didn't we just re-silo IT? That's exactly what, you know, unfortunately that's the legacy and people didn't have any choice. So they've gotten sort of used to doing that. But uh, I think in the software defined data center and, and transforming IT, that's a concept that needs to be completely revisited. Otherwise, in a data center of any size whatsoever, it becomes impossible to have agile and fluid infrastructure that embodies these platforms because they're, they're not operating in concert, they're operating in silos. And you know maybe when you're getting started, that's okay. But, you know, once you really go. We hung again. Involved. 
that becomes a non-starter and, and the economics just break down dramatically. I'm going to have to do, a, I'm going to make a note to myself to do a slight cut here because we stalled a little bit. Oh, okay. Big, big, big bandwidth happening somewhere on the net today, which okay. is actually probably some hybrid infrastructure is working overtime. And, that, and that's the key. I mean, when you think about, I think about hybrid infrastructure and what we need, you need ubiquitous bandwidth to make a yeah. lot of this work. You also need a common way of looking at things. And regardless of where your cloud is, I have to make the hypervisor, the hypervisor that's in those clouds, I have to make it agnostic. I, I can't care about it. Because once I start caring about whether or not I'm on Zen and Amazon or KVM inside of SoftLayer or you know, I'm using OpenStack to do management of a KVM environment in Rackspace, or I'm using Hyper-V inside of Azure. Once I start worrying about those hypervisors, now I'm getting specialized again. And I find that today, unless there's a way to transform all that data that we have as virtual machines or even as Docker containers, whatever we want to do, to work on those environments without us knowing what those environments are, we now have to worry about them again. And that becomes a really, to me, a major headache. Well, and completely unscalable. And, you know, I, I don't want to do too much in that, of an advertisement about about Hotlink, but, um, it, you know, when, when we conceived this company, the the fundamental problem that we saw, and then it was mostly on-premise, not cloud, was that while the underlying hypervisors were operating systems that did almost the same thing, this tight coupling of the administration layer um, with, with these hypervisors was what we wanted to break. So we went about creating an agnostic data model to represent it and then, then transform the platform so they can be invisible to the administration and management layer. And so we took a very bottoms up approach to enable exactly what you're talking about, which is, I don't care about the hypervisor. I need some sort of automation that can abstract it but then make it usable inside of all of the all of the management infrastructure that I've built and I need for my IT operation and and so today you know whether that is a hypervisor in a in a public cloud or a hypervisor on premise the the fundamental problem is the same and if you solve it from the bottoms up with an eye toward um, really preserving the the automation and the tools that already exist in the environment. I mean, that, that's really the problem that, that we both set out to solve and, and did solve. And um, not only that, I mean, if you add that in, I mean, a hypervisor is about the virtual machine layer and what we're running there. But now if you look at how Amazon implements their networking and how all these other, and Microsoft Azure implements their networking, Networking became the next the next hurdle for this because and it's still a hurdle. People are still finding it difficult to move between clouds because their networking just doesn't work the same. And there's and that's and then maybe hopefully SDN will help us solve that. But there's there's more to it than that. Well, and that was another layer um, when when we went to really focus on what does it take to 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 make this interoperability seamless is um, we, we had to implement um, software defined networking and our own product so that inside vCenter uh, administrators could use the the same methods to both discover and configure the networking of the alternate targets, but do it in a way that was intuitive. It could be done, for example, in a test configuration, if this was a disaster recovery application, and then move to the production 
network set up, you know, in the event of a failure. So absolutely. In order to really make it, I, I would say usable, it can't be super complicated and it really needs to be integrated into the operations that customers are, are using today. Else it's sort of more of a, um, I, I would say a, a lab project or a pilot that's hard to take to production. Or you're dealing with a whole bunch of complex things like VPNs and load balancers and firewalls and getting those all configured properly. Abstracting all the networking is the goal of network virtualization. STN is one form of that. What you guys have implemented is a really simplistic version of that that just takes what you do in vCenter and, and maps it out to what you're going to be doing everywhere else. So I have one common model I'm thinking about as the admin. But then it always brings to the other thing that's actually really of interest when you start, start talking about hybrid cloud is everybody says, oh, I'm just going to burst to the cloud. It's like, good, go burst to the cloud. How are you going to get your data there? Because, I mean, they're saying they've got an application sitting in their back that they want to burst out that's terabytes. And it's yeah. like, I don't think you understand what how that's going to happen. What we want to happen in five minutes is like, well, good luck. Physics and doesn't work that way, yes. It, I mean, the network is just not that fast. <laughs> yeah, so you have to be much more premeditated, and it, and it is most certainly possible uh, to, to do effective cloud bursting if you have sort of the right tools and, and the right methodologies in place. But, you know, I think very often, and kind of surprisingly to me in projects we do, Customers do forget about the the physics of transporting data, whether it's data in the virtual machines or data outside the virtual machines. And you know, there are there are a lot of different techniques for dealing with that, but it requires some some premeditated work. Absolutely. And, you know, you you need to to have you know, whether it's some some vendors or some skills in-house that can help you do that in a practical way. Otherwise, you are going to spend a lot of time, you know, rediscovering gravity. Um, <laughs> exactly. And we have already dealt with, right? I mean, you can do only so much. I mean, deduplication of data, WAN optimization, compression, they can only get you so far. And unfortunately, it's not enough in a lot of cases. Some cases I'll give you, it is enough. But for really data intensive applications where you're dealing with encryption, you're dealing with security, that may not be enough. So the, the biggest thing I find is you're right, it's premeditation. I have to actually physically migrate to the cloud and maybe yeah. stage a few things somewhere in the clouds I wanna to go to. Once I stage them there, I mean, let's pick on Amazon. If I stage things in S3, I mean, that's cheap storage. And then I can go from there and burst out into Amazon really quickly because S3 is really fast for them to access. And you can do that with other clouds too. Now, some of the ways that we've dealt with it as, as we got a little more sophisticated in both our um, – disaster recovery and business continuity solutions, as well as cloud bursting is, you know, part of it is you want to keep your virtual machines in sync, but then you also need to keep your databases in sync and, and your large file servers in sync. And, and you implement those differently in the cloud. So while the, the virtual machines may stay dormant in S3 and you're capturing change sets, you you may want to be replicating uh, your large file servers to S3 in such a way that they can be e exported or exposed, excuse me, as, as, you know, a data store that's sitting there in S3. Or, or you may need to keep a database running live in EC2 and then spin up your virtual machine at the time you need to access the data. But it's important that, that you have the tools and the methods to keep particularly these large um, entities in sync in the cloud because there's no possible way 
that you're going to do that at the last minute. I mean, it's just not possible, right? It's not possible. And not only that, clouds have such a unique set of resources. Every cloud I know has a database service. So you want yes. to upload your own database, or do you want to make use of that database service? All of them have a file service service of some form, like an object store. Do you want to use make use of that, or do you want to actually upload your own file server? And it really becomes a question of how are you going to make use of these robust tools that exist in clouds today yeah. and how they fit with your current set of applications. So there is a little bit of thought behind doing any hybrid infrastructure. And this is what we mean by the software-defined data center. I mean, it's like you've got to make choices on software here. That's part of it. But the biggest part is you've got – it's an architecture – it's a set of architectural discussions. Yes. And I, th I think, you know, we, we see sort of, um, you know, a spectrum of, of customer types. There's, there's some that get paralyzed by the possible complexity of all the things they might want to do in the future. And so then they can't do anything in the present because they're, they're trying to design for you know every conceivable configuration they might have in every corner case and so that's sort of one end of the spectrum the other is i'm not planning anything i'm just going to throw some stuff in there and and then i'll worry about how i'll deal with that that later and so you know that has its own um you know detrimental results most likely so i i think the balance of trying to keep that planning simple for a few one or one to three use cases and figuring out how, how would I implement that is probably going to be more manageable than than trying to con conceive an architecture that could handle every possible use case you would have in the future. You know, I think that that's an, sort of a basic and maybe it sounds obvious on the face of it, but you know, it is easy for, you know, we go into these meetings, we go into meetings and, you know, somebody's put together their plan for how they're going to move forward. And inevitably, they're the naysayers in there. And it's like, well, this isn't going to work for our Oracle database or what, you know, what, whatever the naysayer will say. And, and I just think it's important for whoever's presenting this plan to, to bring their team into reality and recognize that they're not going to be able to do it all now. They won't solve everything in the exact same way. And they need to do a reasonable amount of premeditation on, you know, how are we going to manage this? Is our team capable of implementing it? And what are, what are the maybe most most simple yet extensible um, architectural elements that we can implement so that we can move forward, you know, without again being paralyzed by the complexity of every possible thing we could do in the future. And not only that, I mean, if I'm going to have to bring this particular discussion to a close, but when you start thinking about what you need to plan, is start simple. Yeah. Start with one or two applications or one or two concepts before you go right. forward and actually and, and tackle the big Oracle databases. And you may not need to. You may right. just want to launch a network that's tied between the two using a VPN or whatever mechanism you want that just keeps it alive in your own little data center so you don't have to worry about licensing because that's going to be a problem. Yep. And then you can branch out, and then eventually you may say, hey, do I really want Oracle? Do I want one of these new memory-based um, databases that has a Why this backstore? Why Oracle in the cloud at all? I mean, what what's the point of running ERP in the cloud? I mean, maybe that stays on-premise, right? Exactly. And then just, it, it doesn't have to be a one-size-fits-all solution for, you know, the full spectrum of what runs in the data center. And... You know, I, I I hope that the the people that that watch this that are in a hybrid kind of environment will consider, you know, talking to people like Hotlink and others who have been 
working in this arena for a long time and and seeing a lot of different customer deployments and you know some that have been very successful some that have sort of you know maybe not been quite so successful and and maybe there are lessons that can be learned from that absolutely and, and anybody wants to find out more about hotlink go to www.hotlink.com lynn thank you very much for joining us on virtual thoughts thanks edward it's always great to talk to you